Hello. Today we're going to talk about atomic structure. Um, it, section 1.2 covers the nuclear atom, the nucleus of the atom, and the guiding question has to do with how do the nuclei of atoms differ. In this section, 1.2.1, um, we're going to look at um, just the very basics about the positively charged dense nucleus and then the negative electrons around the outside. So to keep it really simple to start out with, um, you know that all matter is made up of atoms. And when you have different types of atoms, they're different types of elements. So um, for example, you could have an element of carbon and that's different from the element of oxygen. And that's because their atoms have different structure. So um, then these elements can combine in different ratios to form compounds. Um, so like you could form carbon dioxide, you could also form carbon monoxide. So the, those are molecules um, uh, that have different elements in them. And so this one would have three atoms and this one would have two atoms. Now to keep it uh, really simple again, if we assume that this is our atom, the nucleus of the atom is very small and dense, and in the nucleus, that's where you have the protons and the neutrons, and in the outside, that's where the electrons are. Um, so the nucleus is positively charged overall, and the electron cloud is negatively charged overall. Um, And the positive charge from the protons attract the negative charge from the electrons, holding um, them to the atom, basically. So I want to mention just really quick, you don't need to memorize the scientists involved with this, but it's good to notice that, um, you know, originally scientists didn't know a whole lot about the atom. So they just, uh, especially starting with like John Dalton, he thought that they were small, hard spheres. Um, and they, you know, that wouldn't necessarily have anything inside of them. Eventually, they discovered the electron. Um, that was J.J. Thompson, uh, discovered the negatively charged electrons, and he created what was called the plum pudding model, where the electrons are just kind of dispersed throughout the space of the atom. Um, and then uh, Rutherford did something called the gold foil experiment. And what he did was he shot alpha particles, which are basically helium nuclei, and he shot them toward the atom. And um, this is called a, a gold foil experiment because he used a very thin sheet of gold atoms. And what happened is when the helium nuclei, the alpha particles, went through the foil, so most of them went straight through. And occasionally, one would hit the nucleus and bounce back or be deflected if it just kind of bumped. Um, but that didn't happen very often. Most of them went straight through. So Rutherford figured out that um, because the helium nuclei were positive, the alpha particles are positively charged, um, they, the nucleus must also be positively charged to repel it. And most of the atom is empty space um, because most of the alpha particles just pass right through. So it's good just to know like, that our understanding of the atom has progressed over time as we're learning more and more about um, what it's made up of. Um, and we, we know even more now, but um, this is how they discovered the nucleus to begin with. So again, here's a really basic um, atom, the electrons are around the outside in the um, electron cloud. In the nucleus, we have protons and neutrons. That's why they call them nucleons protons and neutrons make up the nucleons. And when you have the total of protons and neutrons, we call that the mass number. Okay. If you're just looking at the protons, we call that the atomic number. So the total is the mass number, just the protons is the atomic number. And those are um, both considered nucleons. Now, um, it's worth mentioning that um, though the protons are all positively charged, they do not repel each other in the nucleus. Uh, and that's because the neutrons kind of are there to help stabilize them. Um, and we call that the nuclear force. You don't need to know uh, any more in depth. It, it gets a little bit more complicated, but um, the neutrons are there to stabilize the protons.
Okay, so let's look at all three subatomic particles, protons, neutrons, and electrons, uh, and let's talk about their relative charge. So their relative charge, by that I just mean like compared to each other, the protons have a positive one relative charge, neutrons are neutral, and electrons have a negative one relative charge. Now, if we were using um, coulombs to measure the charge instead, the um, charge of a proton is actually uh, 1.6-ish times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs. And um, a neutron is still zero, of course, but a little electron's charge is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 uh, in the opposite direction, um, coulombs. So uh, it's useful to notice that these um, the two charges are same in magnitude, but opposite in direction. So it's useful for us to just compare them to each other, proton plus one and electron negative one. Now for relative mass, um, the protons will say has a relative mass of one, neutrons have a relative mass of one, and electrons have a relative mass of zero. Um, effectively, the electron's mass is so small that it's negligible compared to the mass of protons and neutrons. And again, if we're looking in that in terms of kilograms, protons mass is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. Um, neutrons is you know, 1.6 times 10 to the negative 27. I'm rounding a lot here just for, for ease of use. An electron would be um, about 9.1 times 10 to the negative 31. Um, so it's so much smaller in terms of orders of magnitude that it's effectively zero in comparison. Now, you don't need to know those numbers. You should know that um, in comparison to each other, Protons and neutrons are one, electrons are zero. Those specific values in kilograms and coulombs will be in your data booklet if you ever need them. Um, but effectively, it winds up being that the nucleus is positive overall um, with all of the mass, whereas the outside, the electron cloud, is negative overall with um, negligible mass. Um, so in a neutral atom, the protons and electrons will be equal. So the positive charges and the negative charges cancel each other out. Um, like if you have a neutral atom of carbon, carbon has six protons, and if it was neutral, it would have six electrons. So six positive, six electrons, they cancel. Um, but we can also form ions, and ions have a different number of electrons. Okay, so they change the electrons. It's much more difficult to change the protons and neutrons because they're in the nucleus, and that's a branch of chemistry called nuclear chemistry. Uh, but if you change the electrons, uh, you can create an ion, and that's the basis of a lot of chemistry that we're going to talk about. Uh, so let's pick an easy one. Um, let's do oxygen. Oxygen has eight protons always. That's what makes it oxygen. Um, now for electrons, if it was a neutral atom, it would have eight electrons, so they cancel out. I'll use um, a positive and a negative here, so they cancel. But oxygen likes to form ions. It likes to form ions where there are 10 electrons. So it would have a negative 10 overall, negative 10 charge from the electrons. And so the, the total charge then on an oxygen ion is negative two. Um, and we would write that like this, um, two negative. We always write in chemistry, we write the number and then the sign when we're talking about the charge. When we write the sign first, it means something different. Um, so just kind of get in the habit of that. Um, so there's an example of an ion. Now this is a negatively charged ion. We call that an anion. Let's do one more example. Um, let's say, let's do um, sodium. Sodium has 11 protons. All so atoms of sodium have 11 protons. And um, if it was neutral, it would have 11 electrons. Now, neutral sodium is not very stable at all. Um, so what happens is sodium will typically lose that one electron um, and have 10 electrons. So now our charge, we have a positive 11 from the protons and a negative 10 from the electrons, giving us a positive one charge overall, which we should write with the uh, number first and then the sign. Although a lot of times we'll just leave out the number and just say plus. And positive charged ions like this are called cations. So anions are negative, cations are positive. Now let's talk notation. Um, you are expected to know this notation where it's A over Z time, uh, next to the X like this. Now A is the mass number. 
which again is equal to the protons plus the neutrons in that atom. Z is the atomic number, which is just the number of protons. And X here is the chemical symbol of that atom. Um, it's not shown here, but you would put the charge in the top corner. So depending on if the if the protons and electrons are the same, then you would have nothing written in that top corner because it would have a neutral charge. But if it um, if you have more electrons and a negative charge, more um, fewer electrons, you'll have a positive charge. Um, so an example, if I'm doing an oxygen um, ion, let's say protons, neutrons, electrons, eight protons. Let's say it has eight neutrons, and um, let's say it's an oxygen ion. Um, so it tends to form, uh, gain two electrons. So it's oxygen. I'm going to use the symbol O. Its atomic number is eight. It's always eight for oxygen. And then in this case, I have eight protons, eight neutrons. So my total for the mass number is 16. And then I have 10 electrons. So that's um, two more than the protons. It gives us a negative two charge overall like that. Um, I will say a lot of times they will leave out the atomic number because if you know that it's oxygen, you know it has eight protons. Oxygen always has eight protons. The protons are the identity factor. Um, however, you are expected to know that that's where it goes if, um, if you need it. Okay, so let's do this example problem um, where you have to figure out atomic number, mass number, protons, neutrons, electrons, and charge. Um, so we'll go through them pretty quickly. Um, this symbol for magnesium here, the top number is the mass number, the bottom number is the atomic number. The atomic number is always the same as the number of protons. And so if you subtract here, um, you'll get the number of neutrons because the mass number is protons and neutrons. So in this case, it's 13 neutrons. Now, this one doesn't have a charge written. That means that it's neutral. So the protons and electrons must be the same. And so the neutral is zero charge. Okay, the next one, we have to write in the symbol. So its atomic number is 15. That means it has 15 protons. And the element that has 15 protons is phosphorus. Okay, and we can also fill in the 15 at the bottom. Now the mass number is 31, so I can fill that in on the top. 31. And then to find the neutrons, I can subtract. Mass number minus the protons gives us the neutrons, which is 16. Um, and then in this case, they tell us that the charge needs to be negative three, which I can fill that in my symbol. But that means I need three more electrons than there are protons. So in this case, I will have 18 electrons. Um, the next example, this time I have eight protons, which we know um, is oxygen. And so that makes it the atomic number as well. And in this particular version of oxygen, I have nine neutrons. So now I have a mass number of 17, which goes on the top. Um, and then in this case, we have the 10 electrons again. So um, I have more electrons than protons, giving me a two negative charge, like that. Last example, I have this um, positive potassium. Um, so the bottom number is the atomic number. The top number is the mass number. And they told us the charge was positive, so uh, positive one. And then the atomic number is always the same as the protons. To find the neutrons, we'll subtract. So we have 20 neutrons there. And for it to be positive, I need fewer electrons now. So I will have 18 electrons in that atom. Um, notice how they have the same electrons. We call that isoelectronic. Um, and they have the same number of electrons. Okay, we have a couple linking questions here. If you're going in a different order, you might want to think about these. Um, so what determines the different chemical properties of atoms? This links into structure 1.3. Um, and since we're focused on chemical properties, what determines them is mostly going to be the electrons. And if we're being more specific, it will be the valence electrons, those electrons that are in the outermost shell, uh, because those are the ones that are going to interact the most with other atoms and react um, so electrons, um, specifically the valence electrons, 
um, the whole atomic structure will have some effect depending on the atom. Um, it, de depending on what's going on, it could affect the um, periodic properties, trends like atomic radius, electronegativity, um, ionization energy, um, different things like that. So the protons and neutrons do affect it, but um, it's always how it interacts with the electrons as well. And our second linking question here links to um, structure uh, 3.1. Again, if you're going in a different order, how does the atomic number relate to the position of an element in the periodic table? Um, so in general order, the elements will increase from smallest atomic number, smallest number of protons to largest, um, but that repeats. So when you get to the end of a row, um, you're going to start in the next row, you'll see a much larger um, atomic number and we'll go across. Um, so when the uh, periodic table was being developed, they noticed a repeat in chemical properties, um, chemical reactivities, which is why they need to start new rows. Um, and you will get to that more when we get to structure 3.1, but um, it, basically you, know, you need to know that it starts with um, the smallest atomic number and works its way up to the largest atomic number uh, on the periodic table.